been up to, Dusty? It's a pleasure to have you back on the show. It's been, what, about a year? Maybe over a year? Yeah, I think it's almost over a year now. It's honestly kind of crazy. I've been all over the place and doing quite a variety of stuff, so I don't really have a good way to explain it, but kind of doing the same thing as last time, but doing a lot more and trying to travel more and just do things I like. That's always the motto of what I'm doing. So a little bit of freelance, a little bit of personal stuff, and then also some social stuff. Yeah, and just try, I guess it, it's all... It's doing the same thing, but scaling, right? And you said before we even started recording, it's interesting to just follow the people because it is a tight community here, right? Follow what everybody's doing and how they're leveling up. Absolutely, yeah. I've been doing this now full-time, like around three years and then in the scene for like seven years. So some of the people have like dwindled off, but like seeing where some of the people have made it to and even just like in my small circle, some like three or four of us have made it full-time. So it's really cool. And then watching people like you guys who I've met along the way, it's just definitely is a wild thing, especially to see like you, they start in one point and then they might end up somewhere completely different, but it's really cool to be able to really follow along, not just like on the sidelines with social, you see so much of the journey. Yeah. And I mean, how are you following along? And I mean, what does following along do for you? Does it inspire you? Are you, are you somebody who gets like excited when other people are winning? Are you, do you get yeah, I, hints, well, hints of I mean, jealousy? Do you, you know, <laughs> I think that I'm quite selective on that front. So like, I guess like you guys that like we've had like connection in terms of this space, we both both maybe added some sort of value to each other. So you guys right. would be, maybe we aren't best friends, likely. Um, I maybe regard me as that, but I we're not. We're, <laughs> I didn't mean it in that way. Right. I realized that. Right. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, you, you've got like these different tiers of people that you meet kind of along right. the way. You of have course. like your right side people. And then those people obviously are cheering on. And then you meet people like your guys' selves that obviously you're rooting for to win. Like we've had some great interactions. We keep in touch. So like for me, I love seeing people winning in what they love and doing the stuff that they love. And beyond that, obviously you have like the superstars in the space, which maybe sparks jealousy, but I always try to turn that into more of a, a drive thing. Yeah. Just like learn from the, those experiences that you're seeing through others. Yeah, I think it's important to remember uh, that... I think we've said this a bunch of times on the show. It's enough cake for everyone, right? I mean, you can get into scarcity brain mode where if somebody's winning, I'm losing, or there's less piece of the pie. Like there's less opportunity for me now. But I, you know, I'm really somebody who thinks that the, it's and it's an endless pie. It's an endless cake. There's always new companies. There's always new ideas. There's always new technology to leverage. There's always new networking connections to make. I, I'd, I'd be curious to to see how many people answer honestly whether they think that pie is infinite or not. Aaron, what do you think on that? I mean, infinite, I don't know, but I think there's plenty of room to find your your own little like creative niche, um, what you're good at. Maybe it's telling stories on Instagram. Maybe it's a uh, video for YouTube. Maybe it's you're great at stop motion animation, like whatever it is, you know, you find your thing and find a little space for your your setup and, and show people what right. you got, you know? Dusty, think, what are you good at? Good. What am I good at? Yeah. Surfing? If you're answering for yourself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Someone said, what am, like, if I'm just asking you, what are you good at in your opinion? Own self-reflection. Like what, are, what, I, like what makes you do well in this space? Honestly, I think that I'm a like slightly above average creator. Like I've gotten this far to be professional, but I think I'm good at chasing the things that I like and finding ways to do that. Like I've done such a variety of stuff, but like the overarching like push behind all of that is like just being genuinely inspired and actually sticking to that. So I think that's like something that I see, like, I feel like a lot of people get, get astray on and like not actually following their interests and where their skill set is at the time or their interests at the time. So I could go and say, Oh, I'm a good photographer and all of these other things. But I think like it's actually outside of the creative skill sets for myself and like, I guess, consistency in that mindset. Right. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying you're not maybe necessarily the best photographer technically, but maybe your competitive advantage is you know what you like and you know what you know what you know very well. Like you're very self aware in that sense and, and what you want to pursue. Yeah, absolutely. I think like creativity stuff aside, it's just like just general life drive is like pursuing those things and being able to to kind of acknowledge what where my passion lies at the moment and like continue going in those directions. It's like adapting and actually like seeing at the whole picture. And so like right now working as a full-time freelancer and a creative is like using my skill set that I have to continue to pursue the stuff that I like. So um, it's a very odd answer, I imagine. But I think that's like where I've with a lot of self-reflection is like that's what's driving mm -hmm. all 
stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, what's a day, what's a day to day look like you look like for you now today as a freelancer? Is it a lot of, are you at a place where you can put your feet up a bit and just have repeat clients? Is it still going out and finding work? Is it, you know, what are you doing to push the creative edge for yourself personally? Even if that's not even, doesn't even involve money, right? Maybe it's certain content you have a passion for, for creating on Instagram that doesn't pay any bills. I mean, what, how are you pushing that, that edge? Cause you know, the people we have on the show, yourself included for the most part are, are always trying to find the next level. Right. right. And I'm curious when people come on, what, what, the method is for finding that next level, maybe even outside of photography. Yeah, I I think this is a huge thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately. I definitely have had like the most successful year last year of like financially, and that allows like just some lifestyle stress alleviation, which is really nice, but I still don't feel like there, it has alleviated all of those stress that creatives have in general, of like trying to push the, uh, to the next level in that aspect. Like, I've been a wildlife outdoor travel type photographer for a long time. And I feel like my Mm. niche kind of, that's what it's been built into on Instagram, for example, using just that like small portion of being a creative. And now I'm feeling like that's not really who I am as much as I love all of those things that I'm creating about it. Like I'm trying to figure out what I want to do on social now, even though I've found somewhat of a success in terms of being a creative and making money and stuff like that. I'm like, now I'm finding myself wondering what I'm doing on social and like it's not I went through a really good growth phase and that was great doing those things but now it's like and I've had the growth and it's like maybe this isn't exactly what I want to do and I guess see myself wanted to build more of that personality and personal brand side of things but then I um, yeah so I'll just finish this thought while I have it there but uh (laughs) and then on that same point it's like I'm I still don't have that like stress-free freelance lifestyle where I have like a bunch of return clients I definitely or in terms of recurring like month to month stuff but i do have mm. a really good client base where i built some good relationships up as well as like good relationship with other creators in the space that do seem to like be bringing me like work on a consistent basis like over the last couple of years um but i definitely am still feeling all those same kind of stresses while i might be able to have a little bit more relaxation i still am feeling a lot of those same things uh, as i was in the beginning but just in a different way yeah, and I mean, what to elaborate a bit on that? What are some of the stresses you feel that other creatives face and that you face? Like, what's typical in that sense? You said there's a lot of pressure that's been alleviated financially, having a good year last year. What still remains um, that you're trying to maybe combat or work to? Uh, I don't want to say eliminate, but kind of accept and and grow with. Yeah, to figure out, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the big things I like I see w- amongst all of us is like just figuring out who you are as an artist and like which is such a fluid thing that's changing constantly. I think that's probably the most relatable thing of anybody that's especially people that have done it like to make a living from you start having more pressure because you are doing things for clients and for other people or chasing social trends that maybe push you in a direction that isn't who you are necessarily. Um, some of the other things would be too, is like just longevity. I come from a very like more entrepreneurial perspective on a lot of creative stuff. And so I think looking at this overarching thing, while I have a great lifestyle and I love what I'm doing, I'm just trying to figure out what that looks like when I start or decide to have kids or when I want to retire and like how, what I'm doing now is actually building into that. And I think that may not be as relatable to somebody that's starting out, but I think it's, or they haven't thought about that as much, but I think that's something that is actually behind the scenes of every creative, because especially if you don't have like a big agency where you can just have a turnkey and pass it over and stuff like that, especially like solopreneur type creatives, that's probably the other biggest one that I am facing in my own place right now with my business. Yeah, that's interesting. I've I've actually had that thought pop in a couple of times. I mean, what does this look like when I'm 30 years older? Right. Yeah. Am I and I think it goes back to again what we talk about. I'm more than a photographer. Like we, we gotta be entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. You gotta have well, you don't have to, but I mean it's worthwhile to, you know, have a have a teaching business of photography or a podcast or I don't know, something that 
that you're able to kind of switch lanes. Is that a fair, maybe fair term, right? Um, what does it yeah. look like for you when you think about that? Like, where are your thoughts? That's what this whole, this whole growing phase or like um, self-introspection thing that I was kind of alluding to is like, I'm trying to figure that out currently, but mm -hmm. I think that Ness doesn't even maybe have to do with photography. I think that it'll, or creative, it'll ha always be a part of my life. And I don't think I want to leave that business model, but I think I want to build in like extracurricular um, industry stuff, whether it's like a new, I'm not that there yet. I'm just like going through these paces, but I like, I do definitely like the, the idea of having a business outside of this, whether that's like a legitimate product launch that's not to do with creative, whether it's, I, I don't want to go into too much detail on that, but something along those lines, or even like starting a copyright, copywriting agency or whatever that looks like, it's, those are just like some examples, mm -hmm. but something that's completely separate so that you have a little bit more depth um, of market, you know, like, I don't know how to go much further into that, but I see myself possibly starting or building into other industries just because I love what I'm doing. And then possibly in the future, if I can separate doing creative for fun and for work and not have to do it for work as much and just have like a personal brand and be a photographer and shoot birds and little things like that, which I love to, you know, and have fun doing that. I think that would be really cool as well. Yeah, so with that, like, with ahead, that sorry. statement, with that statement, I, I'm curious, every, everyone talks about turning your passions into money. Uh, there's the risk of the passion sort of fleeting. So is is that something you experience with, you're obviously passionate about it, you chase things, you're climbing things, you're you're finding things, uh, that's your passion. Now you're, you're kind of stuck to doing client work so that you can survive financially and, and pay for things and your, your basic needs, all that stuff. So that transition, have you felt that? And what's that feel like? How do you get out of that funk? All the questions. Yeah. I guess I kind of maybe like pointed that conversation in the wrong direction because I don't necessarily feel like I've lost that passion. I still love creating. I truthfully don't love having somebody else tell me what to do just in general, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I feel like most people can relate to, but probably at different uh, levels. But I like shooting creative stuff, but I love having the control and like the actual creative direction. So like some things definitely suck that uh, like, creative inspiration out of me, which I really, really try hard not to put myself in those projects. But sometimes things come along and like just really make sense financially or just career wise building relationships. Um, I think on that point of like how to get away from that is like picking a part of the industry or a, a niche, which I don't also love niche your down, yourself down too much, but also putting yourself in a situation where you're going to be able to have that longevity. Like, so for myself, like I obviously have a passion for the outdoors and for wildlife and, and all those things that are just in that outdoor photography niche. However, I've been able to combine most of the projects I do to like kind of fit within that. It doesn't have to be directly re related, but like I was just, um, in the Yukon on an auto project, um, and we were shooting the Northern lights and landscapes mm -hmm. and incorporating another product into those scenes that we wanted to. And we did all the creative direction on that. So stuff like that is like allowing you to kind of be adaptable, but also still stay within your niche. Whereas like you see so often, like wedding photography can be a great business, but I feel like there's so many wedding photographers out there. I'm um, not to be a guy calling that industry out, but I feel like there's so many that just see it. They pick up a camera, then they're like, oh, this could be lucrative. And then they go into that and they realize after they did 30 weddings in like four months that it's really just trade them and it's not actually worth the, the money and they're not passionate about that type of photography too. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a big one, I think. Yeah. yeah. Good answer. It reminds me just to backpedal a little bit when we were talking about longevity, I think it's important to not get your identity too wrapped up in, I am a photographer. Like that's who I am to reference our, our guy again, Aaron Goggins. You know, he said, you know, if, if doctor tells me I'm, I'm physically incapable of running anymore, I'll bike. If I can't bike anymore, because whatever, I'll swim or I'll do something else or I'll switch lanes. I think he uses the example of imagine being a vegan and you get some like kind of food allergy that you can't sustain your, <laughs> your body anymore by eating plant-based diet and you have to eat meat. Like it would rock your world. So I think it's it just made me think about kind of 
not being so attached to a particular identity because if it's taken away from you, you're kind of just like could get crushed. Right. Yeah. So being able to switch lanes, kind of like you mentioned, I'll start a copywriting business. Maybe I won't be a, out in the bush forever, you know, lying prone photographing animals when I'm 75, but I can do this other thing that I'm still wickedly passionate about. Right. So Agreed. it just kind of made me think of that. Yeah. I definitely agree along those lines of just like being adaptable and willing, willing to change. I, Camera, like I don't know where exactly I want on this, but I think that point that you said is pretty much hit the nail on the head of, of not like especially socially wise and and pushing like a dog free career into that. You obviously want to be an expert at something, but it doesn't mean that you can't adapt or incorporate other things into like that personality. For example, myself, especially right now, like and noting on that other conversation with social pressures, is like I love skiing and travel and those things probably more than photography, but now I'm a photographer on Instagram. So I felt that pressure, even though it's probably not outwardly felt, I can probably adapt, but like just because I've been on there and doing that so long, I feel like I can't just adapt and like start doing that stuff there more. Right. Well, this just made me think of a, a question that I'll pitch to both of you. If I told you, you could be like the most insanely great photographer ever, but it's all you can do. Like it's all, it's where all your attention goes to, obviously outside of like family and stuff. It's your one passion that you put all of your energy into, 100%. Would you pick that? Or if I told you you could go, in your instance, Dusty, let's say 80% skiing, 80% photography, like not full throttle, but you can have both at like 80, what would you pick? I would probably, I would definitely pick skiing. <laughs> But like the split or like 100 all in on one thing? Oh, no, I'd put 80 20 if that's, that's what the numbers you said, right? Yeah, or just like 80% effort in yeah. both things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd 100% do that for sure. I've never been like, I love photography because the way it ties into my lifestyle, not because it's just photography. Right. Aaron, what about you? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I, I think I think it's the same. I think photography has gotten me traveling again and and seeing things and experiencing nature and learning from what, the wild, what have you. Uh, but it's not the end all be all, you know. Uh, there's there's a lot of cool things: golf, whether it's skiing, uh, paddle boarding, hiking alone without put the camera down, like that kind of stuff. Uh, and and my day job as well is is a different beast completely but satisfying in a different way so i don't know i like the uh the potpourri of of life just everything i just wonder how many people are out there are like yeah i would go a hundred percent in this thing if it means i would be like the greatest i could possibly be then they would i think yeah interesting yeah. it's like tiger woods would say yes you know like yeah i'm gonna go a hundred percent into golf and yeah, I mean, what I, I maybe disagree with that because like, think of every one of us that you know is like, that's pure, like the photographer on Instagram, for example, that you obviously see they have these other interests, but like when you start talking to them, any one of my friends, for example, has like other hobbies that almost rival or are above their creative thing, especially if you do it full time, just like you said, with your job. And then I have friends that are like Olympians and stuff like that too, on the opposite side of the spectrum, which I obviously didn't make it that far into competitive skiing. And they probably spend just as much time surfing and skateboarding too outside of that, which is like it's almost their job, but they're, they had that much more drive than I did too. And they still have these other facets of interest that are um, equally as interesting to them. Right. So are you saying then maybe that not being 100% fully invested in, that, in only that one thing actually aids your creative output in that thing? I th I'm, I wasn't trying to say that, but I do agree with that, actually. But anybody that I know yeah. that's, like, the best at what they do or some, like, say, an Olympian skier or some of the photographers, like, the bigger creatives that I know that are some of the best in the industry, I would say, have, take most of their inspiration outside of that or they don't even view social media because they don't take their inspiration from that. Interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. I, I, I have some days of, as you know, like as some people know right now, I'm training for a full marathon, my first one ever. And some days I'll be running like yesterday, I was running three hours and I'm like, what am I doing? This isn't making me any money. <laughs> this isn't making me a better photographer. This isn't, you know, like I just have sore legs at the end, which is a great reward in its own right. But you have yeah. those thoughts sometimes. And I had the same thoughts for you. I was like, what is he doing? <laughs> this isn't making me any money. This isn't, 
<laughs> no. Yeah. But you know what? It makes returning back to the other things more enjoyable. It's it's mm-hmm. it's making life novel, which we all crave. We talked about that a couple episodes ago with Arthur, right? And I think it makes me more excited to get back to the other things, right? Because now my legs don't work today and I'm excited to edit and send emails and you know, bust through barriers that way. So I think that's that's an interesting idea as well. Oh yeah. Um, so you were talking about, I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was about 10 minutes ago. Um, you know, when you're networking with people who are becoming extremely successful in the photography world, who you may consider them friends, how does, does that, do you find that that helps you? Like, does that bring you business? Is networking affecting your bottom line? Literally? I know you're not thinking that when you're talking to a friend. I mean, we just we just talked and we support friends because we're good people and we, you know, that's human nature. But is there a byproduct of that? Have you found? Yeah, let's let's call it real, let's call, let's call networking relationship building, and I think sure. relationship building does. I don't think networking necessarily does in terms of oh, I'm trying to build this connection. But I definitely think like I guess for example, like the people I was in the Yukon with that I said earlier, uh, is a friend of mine that I met like around four years ago, Victor Arden, which you guys have probably seen his work, Mm -hmm. super talented guy, but we kind of networked through other friends or built a relationship. And then it's built up now to where we do probably like 35% plus of our work together, even though we have our own businesses. And that's just like one small example. Um, especially bigger people in the industry. I, Try not to be that guy that's like, oh, trying to build those relationships. But when it does happen authentically, I have experienced some monetary gain from that as well. It, not because I was searching that out, but just because you get put in different rooms. But it's like, it's not because I forced myself into that room and it's like, oh, I've asked for that. It's just you build like good relationship there and actually become friends with those people. It's just like how your guys' relationship works is as it right. begins. To rest, it's just like anything like that. You start to find those places that might be a good fit. But then I also have the opposite ones. I'm really, might be really good friends with like a bigger creator, but we don't create in the same way and we don't have any business relationship together too. So I think it's just like about finding that kind of good middle ground of, uh, where it makes sense to pursue those things too. But that's getting a little bit off topic of your original question of like, have I seen the return on those networking things? But I do think, um, that the whole general thing of just building really authentic relationships, as much as that's a buzzword phrase, is like the key to it all. So not putting all your eggs into a couple of baskets, but like being open to these one off relationships that even like these conversations, like Seth put me in touch with Tamron and I've been able to work with uh, Tamron for like over a year now. Um, not that it was a major contract or anything, but it's been a really cool relationship building thing too. And like, that's just from us being in contact doing our podcast. Right. So that's a great example of that. Yeah. That's actually interesting. I want to chat about that because, you know, they were asking me who are some, they're trying to expand more into Canada. Right. And they're asking, you know, who would you recommend? And by no means am I like the Oracle of knowing all that, but I, I kind of sat there and I was like, who would I you know, who would I put my reputation, you know, kind of on the line for? Because it's a reflection of me, right? Who you recommend is a reflection of yourself. And, you know, we're not best friends, like you said, but we're, you know, we, we chat every now and then and we're on a podcast for the second time together. If I ever had a question, I'd hit you up, you know, you'd help me out. And um, so I was like, my criteria was people who do good work and who seem like reliable and who are like nice, friendly. That was literally my criteria. Not, I didn't, I don't even know. I don't, I can't even remember how many followers you had at the time. I didn't care, you know, which is, which is, I just kind of wanted to put that out there, but based on what you were saying, it kind of begs the question. So if someone's listening and they're, they're thinking to themselves, I struggle maybe with that genuine relationship building. I know this is tough to put into words and the way relationships unfold and build and grow and prosper over time is very unique and it's tough to put it into, you know, chronological steps, but in your opinion, how have your best genuine relationships kind of started and flourished either digitally or in person with people in the community? Uh, it, again, it is a kind of a weird thing because we're also unique, um, personally and with our own skills and, and, uh, 
weaknesses. But I think like, honestly, the most powerful thing is finding a unique, uh, a common interest or a common passion. So like all three of us have an interest in outdoor photography, um, wildlife. I think we probably all have more interest than the average person, stuff, than, stuff like that. So like that's an immediate thing, which is going to give us a higher chance of having a good friendship or a good relationship. Um, so even just looking at somebody that's maybe on Instagram, they don't know anybody, they just moved to a new town and they want to meet somebody. I think even for myself, it's just finding those people that are sharing work. This is going very specific to like Instagram creative people, but it's sharing work that's in your own interest. You're already stoked on what they're creating. It aligns with like your values in terms of how they're doing it, um, whatever that may look like for you. And then also just trying to put yourself in those places where they are in a mutual kind of way. Uh, that's going very simple, but Instagram meetups were such a big thing back in the day. Um, they're not as big now. It's usually like individual creators putting them on and there may not be as many people show up, but I think going to kind of those common areas, whether it's like in Calgary, we had Socality House or something, uh, which was created by Scott Back and who's another photographer in Canada, but it, which I wasn't generally frequenting it. However, uh, something back in the day, that would be a great place to go and just like meet other creatives. And you're not going to become friends with all of them at once. Um, but just putting yourself in those situations, especially I, like I'm more of an extroverted person generally. So it's a little bit easier for me to like, even socially reaching out to people or like commenting and just being in those interactions. But if you are more introverted, it's trying to put yourself in places where you're comfortable enough as um, to actually talk to people and get out of your own bubble, I guess it is. And kind of, that's why I said finding a common interest allows you to like alleviate that stress because you automatically have something to talk to. And I also think that it's not going into it with a business mindset. It's like going into it with just like building connections or building community more so than that, even if you are trying to like strive um, for the business side of things. Yeah, I mean, that also, another question when you were chatting earlier, to you, what's the difference really between a networking, the intent of networking and the intent of relationship building? Is it just based on where you are in the relationship, those two words? Or is there a distinct difference in your opinion? I think, I think it's the action of it. I think networking is the idea of like, you and I fly to, I don't know, fly to Montreal and set up like 700 meetings uh, and try to like build business connections through that. I think there can be a way that you're like that type of networking can work just because you're putting face to name and stuff like that. But I think doing like community building or whatever that looks like, I know I was saying, or I don't, what did I use for turn? Something like that. Um, building genuine, genuine connections. Con yeah. Build genuine relationships. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like is taking into the whole, like making a big picture of like, is it realistic to me to build a relationship with, with this person? If we're looking at their social presence, all of these things or the business that they have, is there any reason um, like why it, that's not a very good thing? Is, there, is, is it genuinely going to be a good option for me to make a connection here or is it just going to be me taking from them or them taking from me, I guess? That's like a very broad perspective of that. So I think yeah. adding value, looking at it, of, especially on the social front, is like trying to make friends over money right at the front stages of that. Um, but I think networking is just very kind of can be very sharky versus like just trying to actually build friendships and people that you build friends with and like community community with before you go into business relationships are going to have your best interests at heart way before somebody that you just DM and ask for like, I don't know, support or something like that, or ask yeah. them where about the whatever, you know, that's true. And that's a good point. I think, I think with a lot of clients there's got to if you can show there's a little bit of skin in the game whether you already bought their product and you're a fan like you're like there's got to be something that shows maybe maybe it's trust maybe it's loyalty maybe it's something above hey can i take photos for money like that's yeah. that straight kind of cold call where it's like hey i love your product i did this i could do more of this do you like it like that immediately there's probably a tire connection there where it's like oh that's cool. The person's into what we're doing and no one's more into what they're doing than the company that's running it, you know, because it's, the, it's their passion. So to show that you have that same sort of interest, maybe goes back to what you're saying of making that connection with people, whether it's, I can tell that guy likes skiing. I like skiing. We both shoot, you know, wildlife. This could be a good match. Uh, the company's probably doing the same sort of thing. 
Yeah, absolutely, Aaron. I think that kind of ties it into the, like the business side of things where you're reaching out to brands very well because even if it's not like you said, like, oh, I have the product, it's like legitimately that like uh, mutual interest and stuff. It's like a lot of ways that I'll build that first connection if I don't actually have the product or something like that is like watching their, even if it's like their short films or something like that, it's like, oh, you did a short film on a fly fishing trip in my area. Oh, I love fly fishing. That mm -hmm. And this area is like my backyard. I absolutely love it out here. So cool you did that. And that's like, a really good way to actually tie those in and it shows that you're actually interested in the brand and also that you can do a little bit of research and you're not just like asking 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 i think networking yeah. in terms of the business side is slightly different than just building relationships within like the creative community where you can be a little bit more cut and dry just because in the end of the day you are looking for that looking for a dollar eh, to make things go around but you can build a good friendship with the people behind those brands. And I think that's first and foremost, realistically. Very cool. Would it be fair uh, to say, do you, do oops, you guys think sorry. that like networking is a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Whereas a genuine relationship is offering help, advice, guidance, support without expecting anything in return. Is that fair? Do you think, would you two agree with that? I think that's definitely the right direction but like the way that i see networking is like oh you scratch my back like five times and i may scratch your back uh, <laughs> that's how like that's why I get negative connotation because that's purely because there's people that take advantage in those types of situations i see fairly often you know has this happened to yeah. you no not i'm fairly like i i have a pretty tight circle and i'm have my guards up a little bit in that aspect i have I don't know, but I have seen it a lot of times, especially for people starting out and brands can be doing that as well. It's not just like creator to creator. Ooh, so I think, go. <laughs> what gives you the ick? What gives you the ick in the inbox? <laughs> it's uh, freebies. I'm pretty nice yeah. to be. I always answer all that stuff. I, you got to look at it from the perspective of they're trying to make go by too. And sometimes the people in those positions don't have any budget or their boss is really mean. So. What's your yeah. answer to the freebies? I think it's important when those freebies come across the inbox. Like, hey, can we'll, you know, for, can you send us some photos for a mention or whatever? I think it's important yeah. to, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> is lecture the wrong word, but kind of enlighten people who may not know of why that's not the, it's not the way of the road. Yeah, that's just such an interesting thing for me too because I actually think that the brand. I'd say 75% of the brands know what they're doing and that's like, they don't need to be lectured on it because they know what they're doing and it makes sense from them from a fiscal standpoint. So they're trying to get the most out of it. So like they're, whether, whether you want to use the term of taking advantage of creators to get that like content made. Oh, do we just have them drop? <laughs> yeah. But keep going with your thoughts. Okay. It's still recording. Yeah, all good. Um, whether they're taking advantage of the creator. So like they know what they're doing. Um, but on the other standpoint, it's like new businesses and small businesses that don't have budget behind it. Like the, a lot of people don't have any idea what's going on. So I don't think it's good to like go at their throats necessarily either. Right. So I try to like kind of take a, the midline and not like go too hard, be as informative as possible and kind of um, give them a little bit of rundown or offer like what my rates would be for like the requests and say like, I can't do it at this rate. Unfortunately, I'm not taking any free or unpaid projects, but um, I also yeah. from the business side of things too, which some pure, pure creatives really just don't see from that standpoint. But like looking at entrepreneurially, I try to take that uh, mindset onto, onto those freebie asks. Yeah. It's our, it's our job to say no, they're allowed yeah. to ask for whatever they want. We can go into a restaurant and say, can we have this meal for free? And it's a potential. They might be like, sure, I guess. <laughs> or they might be like, no, no, you can't. And then enough restaurants say, you can't have this meal for free. We're going to pay for a meal. You know? Yeah, I agree on that. It's, it goes also for the opposite of two. Is like, if you don't ask for 10K, you're never going to get 10K. And that doesn't matter the deliverables. It's like, it changes too. So like, just having some sort of awareness to like who those ass are coming from. And that's definitely how I judge my responses for sure. Yeah. He said a good point. I mean, 
first of all, for both of them, they're not going to get free photos if they don't ask for free photos or assets. And we're not going to get paid if we don't ask to get paid. It's kind of as, as simple as that. Right. So you can't take it personally almost, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that, that I, I kind of, uh, have a hard time with people like giving brands a really hard time. And that is just like you as a business are always trying to ask the same as much as you can or not to be like greedy, but you're trying to get the most budget that you can that you think is reasonable and where you can provide value. And then at the same time, like a larger corporation is going to have a different perspective on that interaction as well. It's not like they're looking at as you and it's like, let's just take advantage of this person who puts all their effort into their art. It's like, let's try to get as much spend out of our ad dollars that we have and get as far as that we can. So yeah, right. definitely don't so take it that. It goes both ways. Yeah. 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 And it's, you're usually dealing with middle men or women, you know, hey. you're like, it's not so Seth, you own a company. I'm working for you. Dusty's a creator. I'm going to ask, you know, a hundred people for free photos. Dusty says yes. And I come to you with his assets and I'm like, dude, this dude's going to do it for free just for like one of our shirts. And then he knocks it out of the park. He has this hero thing, no licensing, whatever. We use it on all our billboards. <laughs> I am the big winner. I'm getting a raise. That's, yeah. That's a hell of a sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm it's the a big true, winner. Though. It's so true. That the other point too is like I know people that have they get the same email from a brand and then that's asking for free stuff. And then they turn into like a multi 10 figure project from that brand all by building the relationship and seeing the right things too. So it's like, that's why I don't think it's worth being an a-hole towards yeah, the, every single one of those freebies. Right. Never be an a-hole. Never be an a-hole. Yeah, but uh, if you're not, if you're not, uh, if you're not up to do that work for free, I mean, just, yeah. Do you, in your honest. opinion, do you even need to give a reason why? Or can you just say no? What would you do? I just, I just usually generally say, I don't have the ca capacity to take on any free or unpaid work at the time. This is what I would be able to do in order to fit you into my current schedule. I'd love to work with the brand. Um, there's this, these, these, this, this, and this reason why I think there's a great fit here. I think we can provide each other a lot of value, but under the cir these circumstances, I can't uh, take the product in exchange for what you're asking, but I'm definitely open to further communication. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let me ask you this and changing, changing topics here. Uh, and this isn't meant as like a loaded question or to get your back up, but I'm curious, uh, you know, someone as creative as yourself, how much time maybe you spend gaining inspiration from your social media apps, like viewing and consuming for the, the purpose and intent of all oh, that's cool. All oh, that's neat. I want to try that. And do you ever find yourself getting lost maybe oh okay like i've kind of veered off track <laughs> and how do you catch yourself is that co does that question make sense yeah absolutely i think it's a very good question for me because i'm kind of a little bit scatterbrained especially like using phone so my especially my socials it's not like i don't have my following accounts like who i'm following is like just a mix of everything that i'm interested in from outdoor photographers the photographers in our niche and then anything over to like my pro skier friends and then cooking stuff too. So um, I don't follow anything that I don't ha have interest in. So I look at it all as there's opportunity for inspiration, but I definitely do get off track in terms of just viewing social in general. Um, but are that's something that I'm taking into account, especially this year, I'm trying to get a little bit more conscientious of how I'm viewing that stuff. But I don't also find myself like needing to go and search for inspiration online unless there's like a specific ask where like say for this Northern Lights uh, auto project that we're doing, it's like, oh, we're looking for maybe some different automobile shots that we could do and I'll go and search that out. But on a day to day, like I have my things that like skiing or hiking and my passion of just wildlife in general, that's like fueling my interest or my inspiration that I don't find that I'm searching that out on a day to day, I guess. Right. So when you're storyboarding in your head or on paper, it's just, it's just manifested itself. You're creative. You're, you know, yeah. how does that work for you? How does that process work? Cause I think it's interesting for listeners to hear all, all methodologies. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely one thing for me is like starting on like pen and paper is getting a little, actually like writing stuff down, even on my daily notes, like that helps me get like transferring from my mind into like more of a physical thing. And I can write stuff out like that, but I've been using 
I'm going on the broader scale here of this uh, breakdown, but yeah. I've used an app called Millinote. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's basically like a storyboarding thing and you can put in links, images, all sorts of stuff like that, as well as write notes all in one place. So for me, especially looking at like a larger freelance project where we're um, bringing in like multiple people, that allows you to see all of you see the same thing and put inputs there. But then the creative definitely takes me a little bit of time to kind of get down. I'll write down like a general overview of that, which is like the client's not going to see any of this, but, but kind of just getting my original, like my initial sh thoughts, like down as, as much and as like detailed as I can. And then I like to like, just let it breathe for a little bit of time, depending on obviously the, like the turnaround times, but I definitely need time to think about things like the inspiration definitely comes from many sources, but it's usually not like sought out. It's like shower. I was like, oh, this is where that transition will come from. Or like, this is like a nice way to tie in these interior shots to like the, the nature scenes or something like that. And those like detail pieces that I haven't figured out from the puzzle usually come a little bit later, but I try to flesh it out and give myself as much opportunity to see the whole picture um, to like fill in those little cracks. Um, because I find if I go too detailed right away that I'll have like this really, really detailed plan all the way through. And then I'm missing out on like key aspects that sometimes come at a later time. Whereas if I have like a little bit more of a broader overview, when I'm approaching something like getting a good idea of like, like just generally how I'm shooting this, are we doing like more handheld stuff, 24 frames per second, or like, um, the type of imagery, like whether it's more landscape wide shots or a lot of tight, obviously you're getting a lot of mixture of stuff. Those are just examples, but, um, just having that broad, broad opportunity allows me to like kind of pull from a lot more areas versus having like a really detailed structure to it for myself. Anyways, I know when you get into like the higher level production stuff, like usually you have that creative down to a T and that allows you to like execute things a little easier, but kind of in the mid range where we are right now, we have pretty lean team and we can kind of, uh, adapt and, and change as we go. So that's kind of the structure that I use. So when you're thinking about maybe some more nuanced decisions, like, okay, for I've got this scene that I've envisioned and I need to decide what focal length I want to use or what do I want motion in this shot? Are those, are you figuring those ideas out on the fly? Are you ahead of time sitting down and with intent, dedicating time to figuring out that problem? Or is this more of a shower thought as you, yeah. You know, put, or is it a well, mixed bag? And right now I'm a pretty big mixed bag. Honestly, I'm like I said, I'm pretty scattered range if I'm going to be in all honesty, creatively and all those things. So having that structure, like I said, there is really great. But um, I'm also no director at this point. Like I'm getting to learn how to do all these different parts of being a creator, but I'm not working on large pr productions. But I definitely think uh, it's better to do the latter of like getting very detailed and having like really good um reason behind like your shot choices but the team that i work with we usually have like i said like a fairly broad overview and like the stylistic feel say for a video project that we want and then in the field we can adapt to like whether we want to use a long shot or a wide shot or just capture variety i think as we start to like get into these larger stuff that's more on the commercial side and beyond social it's maybe like a small TV spot or something like that, you have to have that nailed so that you can execute within the time and with your talent. But since a lot of our stuff is like really under control, we go a little bit uh, cowboy with it, I think, and more so than maybe that you should. Um, but that's just being honest about how things are. And we work really well together and you can kind of bring that together. And then also things that it also depends on how you like to edit too. If you're okay with being having a little bit left to... Uh, the editing side and meshing that story together, you can get away with some things, but if there's certain shots, we'll usually execute like the ones that are musts and then build out from there, especially if we don't have that good of a plan in yeah. terms of folk bikes and what, uh, but not like that. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say there's kind of two spectrums when you're putting together a, a video, whether it's a real or a long form video i mean i'm no expert but in my my experience i've i've gone the route of i'm going to film exactly what i need and then i can build my story or i'm just going to film everything and then when i get home i'll build the story from what i have have you done both of those things is there is there a better approach i mean I, you kind of just touched on it but yeah you can elaborate no, that's on a, my my spectrum 
<laughs> that's exactly what I'm kind of talking about. Like we go from the spectrum of like commercial production, like in LA or something like that. They have every single shot list or like a car commercial. They have it down to the T and then they'll have like a pickup guy, which is picking up all the extra shots. That's maybe they'll toss it in, which is just like a running gun setup. But I find for myself, especially because we do have a little bit more latitude of like social stuff, especially if it's more my channel, it's like I'm generally the last person that has a say on like those creative things. So while I want to be more of like write it down, get everything very like dialed in, I just often too with the budget and the time and some restraints with like not having five people on set, I think mm -hmm. the, I'm fitting in that place uh, where you want to be have your details the stuff that you really need to so you're not overshooting but then also have like leave it up to like being able to do a little bit more of that uh just random shots like you're shooting everything like you said i think that's kind of a nice place to be because then you're not overshooting like we've both run into before but then you also have the confirmation that you've already nailed these like really key shots and oftentimes especially with like the smaller scale stuff you can kind of get away with that yeah yeah, I overshoot when I'm when I've booked a plane ticket to somewhere that I don't know if I'll ever be back and it's a lot of money. I say I'm going to shoot everything. This is more personal, right? Yeah. But I think you got to mind yourself like if it's commercial and you're overshooting, you're costing yourself money, right? Really? And time. Totally. That's time a good and money. Yeah, I was just going to say that's a really good way to look at it too because like I shoot so much stuff often like for my personal thing that just like it never ends up going where it's anywhere but then also the odd time that you do or if you have a really good project in mind and you've overshot and it's like memories with friends and family and stuff that's for social that's also really cool to have and go back to so it's like as a creative we have like this spectrum of all these things and looking at a commercial project compared to something that you're shooting of your family and friends on a hiking trip to like a small brand partnership it's like just looking at it of what's going to give you the best return on like your input and i think it doesn't have to be like fiscally wise or like um, in terms of just direct pay to time input, but it's just like all of these things are constantly changing and, mm. and the best that you can look at through a lens of, um, if yeah, of that way is like that it's always changing is going to be the best. Yeah. Kind of weird. That's so, a ramble. No, it's good. What are you working on right now? And not like project wise, but just like skill wise that, you know, you're excited to kind of learn this skill, but you feel like a complete rookie in. Is that, uh, you know, is there anything well, on the table? I, I I know someone like yourself is constantly trying to learn, you know, it's, yeah. it's a common denominator with creatives who are trying to push the limit. So, but we all feel like rookies, you know, <laughs> when we're trying to learn that new thing. Yeah. I'm curious if there's anything on the plate right now for you. Well, we've just been talking about it for half an hour as getting storyboarding and stuff like that. It's like, I'm in that place where I said I'm halfway in between and some of the bigger things that we've had coming up is like, it's definitely lacking and actually having that like, uh, pre-production really nailed and it's not like every single shot has to be there but like just making sure that you have the really good structure or the skeleton of the project so that we can we especially if you don't have a lot of time or if you have time restraints so that you can kind of nail those things it's something that because we've been doing kind of small social stuff or like our own shoots is like get pushed to the side on those but I definitely f have felt the pressure sometimes when um, I didn't really get it all planned out all that well. And that's definitely been something that I'm trying to work on. And it's also like the way to do it and how to get that down into words. So it translates to other people on the set and also just beyond just the storyboarding is like the production side of things is like actually producing it, getting your models, contracts, all of those things as right. things start to scale up. It's like when you're a fairly small team, it's like you have a lot of hats, but also trying to how to figure that out. I I mean, I can keep going on of things that I want to learn. It's like even just trying to <laughs> properly budget projects and like especially when budgets started to get bigger and how you're quoting to actually maximize what you're getting and then actually being real realistic on how much time you want to put in, what gear you need, all those types of things. So like I think that's a constant learn, especially as you evolve as a creator because the scale is changing and then you so all of a sudden may have a much larger budget, but you've brought on way more people or more um, gear or whatever that is, models, anything like that. And then all of a sudden you're not profiting as much too. So that's a mm -hmm. um, fairly important thing. This is not so much creative related, but I think that's something that I'm always striving to get better at, especially as like we said, like 
just being a good businessman, even if we have to transition in the future, is uh, a really good skill set to have. So that's something that I'm striving to get better at. And then there's simple things like getting better at color grading or having a better timeline um, strategy or structure or things like that. Photography, I don't have as much to. I'm, I'm fairly satisfied in that, but video is definitely something that I'm trying to push. You sound exactly like me, where it's like photography yeah. is kind of not saying that you can't get any better at photography, yeah. right? Or that we're experts, but it's kind of like, I get it. I get my workflow. I know I, I, I need something to like suck at for a bit and like learn, right? And I for love sure. asking people these, I love asking people who are in the process of learning new skills what's working for them in that current moment. Cause I, I just feel like you get more insight from asking somebody how the climb of Mount Everest has been when they're halfway up versus at the summit to use that analogy. Yeah. Does that make sense? I feel like you can I get do, a lot totally, more. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and, and anything you've just talked about, whether it's storyboarding or budgeting, you know, you've just caveated by no means are you like the expert, but what are maybe some one or two key points you've learned that have like helped you or your business or you as a creative that you feel would be useful for people listening? It, I think you said it, I got the start there when you're introing all these questions, which is just like the being open to constantly learning. It's like, even now we said we're doing really well, or we feel confident when our skill set in photography is like at that same point is like, I've still been learning things or different strategies on how to do that. And I'm open to, to that. But I think the basis is just being open to learning and actually like searching out ways to improve and being very analytical or self, uh, aware to being like, oh, I'm not like an expert expert at this. There's probably ways that I can improve. And so like just taking time to do a self uh, reflection and being realistic on like spent whether it's business, creative or this and like which is going to bring you the most value. And I also think it's like we've been talking about this whole time is like having these very transparent conversations with friends and close people in your inner circle. Sometimes the best like creative partners or business people that you work with don't have to be friends either but um being able to talk to somebody that you respect and ask them for their honest opinion on your situation and stuff like that and hear where they think that you can improve on whether it's creative business or even sometimes just relationship wise is like a huge thing i think for me and i have lucky to have like a community or a small circle of friends that i trust with those opinions and then on that same merit is like making sure that you find those people and not just taking anybody's opinion on those things too. Yeah. yeah finding that's a good balance, point. Huh? Finding yeah. Balance, you, know? you, uh, you obviously allude to Instagram being a big, uh, cornerstone to your, your personal brand, your business. Um, I mean, I started in Instagram five years ago, so I have a snapshot of what social media and Instagram looked like back then and what people were complaining about what it used to look like five years prior to that. And now we've jumped forward. I'm curious where you think this whole thing's going in the next five years. And are you just using that surfboard behind you and riding the wave? Or do you have a sort of uh, strategy or investment strategy, if you will, in terms of where you think it's going? Are we in trouble? Are we in good hands? What are the skills we need for the future? Oh, that's a very big question. It's like, I've, I'm not frustrated with Instagram, but it's like, it does change so often. So it's like my mindset is a little bit skewed right now because I don't feel that confident in what I'm doing there. I'm trying to re-figure um, out what that is, like not for the app necessarily, but like who I am on Instagram. So like, that's a big thing for me right now. But then mm -hmm. you look at across the platforms and just the way that social is growing totally. I personally don't think it's going anywhere, but it's like we're talking about uh, looking at like how brands are and some people go at, look at it of like a really negative thing when they're asking. It's like, that's how I look at Instagram in general as well. I think that there's pretty much always some sort of opportunity. We're still seeing people that are growing there. I think the big thing that could be something to be aware of or thinking about is like, the way that brands are spending and where their marketing budgets are going. I don't have fear right now because I think if you're building a good business skill set that you should be able to pivot and that's going to be a huge thing, but it might be an adjustment to see how maybe brands are bringing on UGC people in house and they're not going to creators. So I definitely am thinking about that. I definitely invest a fair amount of time i've over the last about only about a month or so i have seemed to like just pull back it wasn't like a conscious decision i got 
quite busy and a lot of things were happening since the new year. So I haven't been posting as a lot. And I've actually been declining in followers for the first time in a little bit of while. So that's interesting. And that's hard too, because you feel like, oh, you have attached it to all these things and you want to keep growing. But at the same time, it's almost good to realize that I can still be successful in my business and I can actually be losing followers. So that's been kind of a weird introspection to have, even though I do mm-hmm. have aspirations to keep growing and building those relationships with that um, followers on Instagram. But mm-hmm. uh, overarchingly, I think use in the right way, like social in general is a fairly positive place for creatives to be. And I don't think there's any fear and continue to do that as long as you're using it with the right amount of balance and actually building skill set and like putting fires in the iron outside of um, just this fire. If that answers your question, I kind of went all around the place there, but those are kind of like general thoughts. on Those are your thoughts on it. I mean, well said, a lot of good points. Uh, It is ever changing. It is different. And you know, my short time, the, the, Instagram live was a huge thing. Nah, then the reels, of course, a lot of stuff in between, uh, a lot of things being promoted threads, you know, uh, what else do we have? That's just was so hot. And then not (laughs) too many clubhouse. (laughs) Yeah. What are your guys' thoughts on that? I would love to hear that actually. I know it's I'm chatting, but I'd love to hear it. No, I think, I think it is forever changing. I think they're, they're trying to incorporate, everything that's cool out there, right? Like they, they copy the Snapchat thing with stories. They're, they're doing the TikTok thing with reels. They're, I think, doing a decent job of competing with those entities. Um, I think if something cool comes up, you know, they might swallow it up. Uh, it's just it's just an interesting, I think, environment for social media and where it's going. It, it's definitely media and ad heavy uh so like um i'm sorry video and ad heavy for me i see very few photos from creators um maybe one and then there's definitely an ad or sponsored posts and then a lot of reels so that's definitely changed um i know me personally for photos they don't they don't go very far anymore you know and that's just been a change and that's okay it's still it is what it is uh, without it, I don't think my photos would, anyone would see anyone except my friends when I'm texting them. So it's still a cool service. It's still a cool thing. Um, definitely, a a casino effect with the reels and going viral and all that stuff. Um, they know what they're doing. So that's what I'm seeing. All right. Well, to wrap up, if you had to give one piece of advice to your beginner photographer self, what would it be? Just keep going. Super, super simple. But it's like, like I was saying with seeing people like ourselves starting out is like some people have fallen off, but it's only because they didn't continue. I've seen people that I met at the start that didn't find really success until this year, looking at Instagram wise or other things like that business. But even if they had to pick up another job for a couple of years and stuff like that, they stayed with it. And then all of a sudden they'll like blow up on Instagram and then then in turn follows also freelance too. It's like, if you just stick with it, even if you're not on socials, um, you're going to learn those skill sets over time. And even if it's behind the scenes, like learning those things is, even if you don't become a full-time person ever, those skill sets are going to transcend beyond there. And then it's just, it's so nuanced and cliche to say, but it's like, just keep going and be persistent. And hopefully you will, and be self-aware and you'll learn along the way. That's like as simple as I can go. And like, I honestly think that's the biggest thing to be honest. Uh, yeah. It, Makes sense. Keep going. That's as much yeah, as I'm I mean, going to say. You'll eventually get there as long as you don't stop. Yeah. I mean, within reason, right? I mean, I'm not mm-hmm. going to be able to dunk a basketball. I'm not going to try that, uh-huh. but I know but I'm good at photography. <laughs> yeah. Okay. To your point, self-awareness. Right. You exactly. got to self And yeah, you, you got to know what you're good you at. Might, you, know what, you might be able to. Yeah. But I just hang from the monkey bars for a year and grow to six six and yeah. no, no, you gotta follow there's shorter there's shorter people than you that have dunked. <laughs> there's You're also genetics. Yeah, there's also genetics. I'm not dunking a basketball anytime soon. I'm just no, I I'm a very that. optimistic after the, person. After the marathon, after the marathon, <laughs> go into a training program to dunk. Let's see. Just I go, agree. With, go follow, uh, follow knees over toes guide. 
if you don't follow him already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, and you'll be able to fix those knees up and you'll be able to jump. Knees over yeah. toes guy. I like how you both know what that is. I'm sitting here. He's so going, one of the best is... uh, physio niece guy on Instagram. Oh, it's a physio guy? Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. I love watching really... the Athlean X videos. Jeff Cavalier. I don't know that. You know that? Oh, what? I know Jeff Cavalier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're a gym guy. Come on. That guy fixed my IT Jeff, band yeah. pain. I was like, this guy's as good as that. Yeah. yeah. All right. I trust you. I you trust you. Well, Dusty, yeah. thanks for coming on for a second time, buddy. Really appreciate it. You're welcome back anytime. Yeah, good chat. And, uh, excited yeah, to see. Yeah, I love uh, chatting. <laughs> yeah, excited to see where your content heads. Sounds like you're trying to align it more with who you are and that's ever changing. You know, it's exciting to see people evolve, start new chapters, keep some of the same old, bring in some new. So I yeah, appreciate you having me. Yeah. Thanks very much. I yeah. appreciate your time as always as well. Yeah. You too, bud. Absolutely. All right, guys. Till next you. time.